Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English B, and uh, this morning our activity on page 1096 is to work with the great T.S. Eliot's poem, The Hollow Men. Now, let's make that uh, list of the great writers of the English language from 1800 forward. Miss Keller, in the second semester, I'll talk with you about pre-1800, because that's our English <coughs> book, um, units one, two, and three, all right? If I could take you back in time to September, which seems like an eternity ago, but really was just a few weeks ago, I would remind you of some really important names and texts. One, I would have to mention Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey, right? Those days have passed and all its aching sorrow, all its aching joys are now no more and all of that. You'll remember that was a fairly lengthy poem that required us to spend several days talking about it. However, once we were able to get through Ten Turn Abbey, we pretty quickly got through the young guns of Byron Shelley and Keats. And the work of Keats culminates with Ode on a Grecian Urn. And that would be kind of like the next major text. If I were, if I were kind of putting this in some kind of hierarchy or order, I would say, first of all, we've got Ten Turn Abbey. Second of all, then we would have uh, Keats, Ode on a Grecian Urn. Okay. After that, we're then ready to move beyond the Romantic period. And then we have a series of really important writers, but they're not as important as a Wordsworth or a Keats. Okay. Here, for example, we would think of uh, uh, Tennyson. And Tennyson will then be kind of our next big gun, and that text, Ulysses. It little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a, a newer world and all of that. Okay? That time period we called the Victorian time period of roughly 1880. All right? So we go from 1800 with, ten, with uh, ten Turn Abbey and Wordsworth and Keats to 1850, roughly 1850 to 1880, and, that, and that's the time of the, the Victorians and Tennyson's Ulysses. Uh, of course, you'll want me to maybe mention as well Browning's Prophyrus Lover and all of that as being part of that time period of the Victorian era. And then 1900 happens, and that's where I'm ready to start now. The century you were born in, 1900. We heard that poem from Hardy called Darkling Thrush about a bird that's singing on December the 31st, the last day of the, remember, 19th century, remember all of that? Right before the 20th century begins, the century you were born in. If you were to go back and read the newspapers on that day, January the 1st, 1900, the beginning of that new century, there was unbelievable optimism. Unbelievable optimism. People were writing things like the following. In the 20th century, I'm not kidding, if you want you to do your own research here. In the 20th century, there will be no more hunger. No kidding. No more poverty. No kidding. Everyone will have the best life of all time because of technology. Technology is going to save us. We've invented ways, for example, to grow so much food. It, it's impossible anymore to imagine that anyone on this planet would not have something to eat. There was great, great optimism. The world is going forward. Everything is going to be great. Then, 14 years later, that's a huge moment. You want to write it in your notes. What happens 14 years later? What happens in 1914? We have what's still called in England the Great War. That's how they call it. The most horrific single example of destruction of human life to that point happens for those four years. Why? Because of technology. So, for example, in the fields of France, where they're fighting in those trenches where they dig down into the ground, well, a really smart guy figures out, we can make this long wheel track vehicle that's really heavy. We can just drive across some of those um, areas, and we'll just collapse all those people down in, uh, in the ground, and we'll just bury them alive. Great idea. We can fly 
in airplanes that we've now invented, and we can drop these little explosives out of the planes that are open cockpit planes. They don't go very high in the air. And we'll drop them, and when they hit the ground, they'll explode, and a gas will come out of the explosion you can't see. It's a little bit yellow, which is why they call it mustard gas, and it will attack the membranes of the eyes and the lungs and the throat, and you quickly will suffocate to death by your own body's chemistry turning against itself. Horrific way to go. That kind of chemical warfare gets used in the Great War, in the First World War. That chemical warfare is so brutal that in the Second World War that will happen in the 1940s, they actually get together and agree not to use that stuff. That's how bad it is. That's how bad it is. Both enemies get together and say, okay, we're going to slaughter each other in the scores of th tens of thousands, but we're not going to drop that stuff from the 1940s. Let's point it this way. By 1915-16, the optimism that began the century is virtually gone. Gone. A dark pessimism has set in. No one imagined that so many people could die the way that they died. But there was a voice that already had predicted this. Ah, love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor light, nor certitude. What poem am I quoting? You're right. Who is the author of that one? Do you remember what his name was? Matthew Arnold. Arnold's vision, remember what his word picture is? Remember our word picture of being in the gym watching those poor little freshmen try to run from one side to the other to get their thousand bones? Right about the time Dewar turns out the lights, right before they get to the center of the floor? Total chaos. That's Arnold's vision before the First World War. When the First World War happens, people pick up a poem like Dover Beach and go, holy cow, that guy was predicting what ultimately happened, which is chaos. Out of this experience comes a poetic voice that we will label as the most important single voice of the 20th century. His name is T.S. Eliot, Thomas Sturge Eliot. In 1922, and that's the important date for you to write down in your notes, in 1922, Eliot will publish a poem called The Wasteland. Well, that sounds like a cheerful title, doesn't it? The Wasteland. That poem almost immediately is identified as the most important poem yet written in the, in the 20th century. It's only been 22 years. That poem, by the time you're born, you're born roughly, what, 19... 94, 95, 96. By that year, 94, 95, 96, when you're born, when I'm lecturing that poem in 1994, right? When I'm lecturing that poem in 1994, I already have any number of experts I can call up, I would say on the internet, but there wasn't much of it back then, uh, that would say that the most important poem of the 20th century was 1922 T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. Okay, so by the time you're born, T.S. Eliot is already considered the greatest poet along with a guy named W.B. Yeats, Y-E-A-T-S. Yeats writes a poem called Sailing to Byzantium and another poem called Second Coming, and both of those poems are usually anthologized as being just as important as the work of T.S. Eliot. We'll get to that one as we were talking about possible memory points for next week. That part one of Sailing to Byzantium, that is no country for old men and all of that. Um, we'll, we'll get to it, okay? We will, we will listen to the wasteland, Mr. Harder, here at the end of this week, beginning of next week, just because I want to expose you to it. We're, never, we're not going to have any questions on the exam over it. It's too difficult, too long. Uh, but what I, it's about, to hear it read out loud, it's about 35 minutes to hear it read out loud, that poem. What I want to say, though, about the wasteland is this. If you want to understand the wasteland, you read the cliff notes. The cliff notes are called the hollow men. I'll say it again so you understand what I just said. If, for example, I give you a novel to read like Frankenstein and you don't have time to read the novel or you want to know what it, what it means before you read it, you pick up what we call cliff notes, right? You read it and it tells you what it is, right? That's what cliff notes are. If you want to know what the, what the wasteland is about, all you have to do is to look at T.S. Eliot's poem, The Hollow Men. It's a shorter version, if you will, that kind of paints the picture of the human condition 
Now let's put it in your notes this way, what, what he will call uh, modernity. Now that's a word that sounds confusing until you, until you spell it. Once you spell it using what word? You have to spell the word modern to spell the word modernity. All right? In other words, T.S. Eliot's going to give us a picture of what it means to be a modern person. Roughly 1920. So we're 20 years into the century you were born into, and T.S. Eliot writes a poem called The Hollow Men. Now right away, I want to jump to a couple of 2B observations in your notes. We're just talking about the form of this poem. Notice before I read it, and we'll obviously exegete it right, Miss Benitez, but notice a couple of things. First of all, on page 1096, notice that there's a couple of little quotes at the top of the poem. Do you see that? Those are like epitaphs or something like that. Okay, That, that um, epitaph is explained in some regards over on the right-hand margin. We'll talk about it in a moment. The second thing I'd like to point out just for your notes at level one, because this will help you. Do you see those Roman numerals on the, on the poem? Do you see it? It's Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three. Do you see that, Mr. Durant? Roman numeral four. Then go ahead and flip the page, top of page 1098, Roman numeral 5. This is what I recommend, Mr. Brown, you do in your notes. I recommend that you actually write Roman numeral 1, then skip a few lines, Roman numeral 2, then skip a few lines, Roman numeral 3. What poem did we do this of Shelley's with? Do you remember? If winter come, can spring be far behind was the last line of that poem. Do I have anyone that can remember Ode what that? West. Ode to the West Wind. Outstanding, Mr. Armsbaugh. That Ode to the West Wind had how many parts? Six. You're right, Ramos. It was five. That's right. T.S. Eliot is playing a similar game. By the time Eliot writes The Hollow Men, Ode to the West Wind is a very popular poem. And this notion of dividing your poem up into five parts is going to follow from, to some degree, what Shelley had already done. Let's take a look now at this poem, The Hollow Men. What I would say is, let's just read it together, okay? Then we'll begin the process of exegeting the first part. Clearly, we'll run out of time. I'm going to work right up until the end of the hour. Then we'll come back tomorrow, and as soon as you get here and have everything lined out, as soon as the bell rings, I'm ready to go to work. Hopefully, I can get through all of Hollow Men tomorrow finish and allow you to begin to maybe hear some of the other poetry of T.S. Eliot, all right? Let's take a look now at the poem itself, The Hollow Men. Don't worry about understanding it. I would say it this way, just like I said it about before Ten Turn Abbey. Don't worry about understanding it. Try to experience it. So while I read, follow along. Actually use the tip of your pen and follow along. Try and stay with my reading. If you can stay up with my reading and my modulation, then you know you're doing okay. If, for example, you keep getting farther behind, you know you need to work on your reading. Does that make sense? It also helps you to stay focused. All right, here we go. 1096, The Hollow Men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass or rats feed over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remember us, if at all, not as lost violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. Eyes I dare not meet in dreams, in death's dream kingdom, these do not appear. There the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There is a tree swinging, and voices are in the winds singing, more distant and more solemn than a fading star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow skin, cross staves in a field, behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that final meaning in the twilight kingdom. This is the dead land. This is cactus land. Here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in death's other kingdom, Waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips 
that would kiss form prayers to broken stone. The eyes are not here. There are no eyes here. In this valley of dying stars, this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech gathered on this beach of the tumid river. Sightless unless the eyes reappear as the perpetual star, multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom, the hope only of empty men. Here we go round the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is, life is, for thine is the, this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Now, for many of my seniors, reading this poem out loud, while having some kind of strange, captivating sense to it, is about like hearing Tin Turnabby read out loud for the first time. Mr. McGee, you might as well have been standing up there with that, uh, you know, voice and going blah, 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 to me, because if I had to now turn around and tell somebody on the outside of 303 one thing this poem even means, I fear I would probably struggle. Hurrah to that, I say. Because by the time we finish, you're going to know this poem pretty well, and you're going to understand it pretty well. Remember, we had the same observation about Ode to the West Wind in Shelley's poem. When we finished reading it, it seemed as if, really, I don't know if there's a whole lot I can gain from this. I promise you, many seniors have told me in their evaluation, which you will also do in May as you evaluate the class, many seniors have said, uh, that, that poem, Holloman, is the one I keep coming back to. It has, a, it has a resonating effect to me. Let's make a couple of biographic observations about T.S. Eliot real quickly. Eliot is an interesting cat because you already met him. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights and one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. I'm quoting what classic poem from your junior year? The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock about an old man who realizes that he's aging and he soon must die. And the only thing of merit now for him is to ask, do I dare disturb the universe or do I dare to eat a peach? He says in classic language, and this is the way I actually came to T.S. Eliot. I hate to admit it, Mr. Judice, but at university I was sitting in a class with a really famous poet, and I was daydreaming when I heard her say for the first time, I should have been a pair of, of a ragged claws scuttling across the floors of Silent Sea. And I went, do that again. What did you just say? And she was like, what? And I said, because I was daydreaming, and then all of a sudden I heard that, and I was like, dude, anybody can say I wish I'd been born a crab at the bottom of the ocean. It takes a poet to say, I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And she said, well, if you've been listening to my lecture, I was talking about the great poet T.S. Eliot and his love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And I went, I oh, got it. I'll, I'll look that one up, you see. Um, Eliot is interesting, though. Notice, I said you were introduced to him last year. Wait a minute. We were juniors last year, and we were studying what? What kind of literature last year? It was in our yellow textbook hymnal. Why? Because we were looking at American authors. You're now in a purple lit textbook of British authors. And we're looking at T.S. Eliot's The Hollow Man. Now is that two different guys with the same name? No, same poet. Wait a minute, how could we have studied the guy T.S. Eliot last year as an American author, and now we're looking at The Hollow Man as a British author? Yeah, but hello, a lot of American authors moved to Europe and lived in England. Lots of them, lots of them. Well, what's going on? 
T.S. Eliot is actually born as American as you can get in the Midwest. He's born in St. Louis. I mean, you can't get much more Midwest than St. Louis. And he goes to Harvard, but he doesn't finish because he doesn't like it there. And he leaves and he goes to England where he begins writing poetry. Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock is his first major offering. There, in England, he gives that poem, he sends it to a guy named Ezra Pound. You'll want to put that name in your notes. Ezra Pound. Pound is a really influential guy in American, po in American and uh, in international poetics because he finds, discovers new talent. He's an American poet living in England. He says about Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock two things. One, he says, the minute he reads it, he writes in a letter, he says, uh, two things about this poem. One, I do not have a clue what it means. He says that. The great poet, Pound, says about Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, T.S. Eliot's poem, I don't have a clue what it means, but secondly, he says, I know I'm reading genius. Whatever it is, this is there's some kind of genius going on with this cat. They become pals. Pound helps him to publish in 1922, The Wasteland, and as well this poem, The Hollow Men. T.S. Eliot renounces U.S. citizenship and becomes English. That's why he's considered a British poet as well as an American poet. So both Americans and British will celebrate this guy as one of the great poets of their tradition. By the time T.S. Eliot dies in 1965, by the time he dies, right before he dies, he comes back to the United States to give a poetry reading tour. He sells out RFK Stadium, that large stadium in Washington, D.C. He sells that stadium out for people to come and listen to him read his poetry, which tells you that he had already seen great, great success. For a long time on Broadway, the number one selling show was a show called Cats, where these actresses and actors dressed up like cats and they recited poetic lines. Those poetic lines were all written by a guy named Thomas Stearns Eliot. There was a, 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 a little survey that Stanford did a few years ago that said, of all of the people that wrote in the 20th century, Eliot would have made the most money if he had lived throughout the entire century because of all the sell of all of his stuff, especially his poetry and cats. You see the royalties he would have made, etc. T.S. Eliot's The Hollow Men is where we now will spend our focus. Let's make some general observations as the bell gets ready to ring. One, The Hollow Men is T.S. Eliot's assessment or evaluation of what it means to be modern. And he says the following, we are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Well, now, wait a minute. What does hollow mean? Empty. What does stuffed mean? The opposite of empty. Let's put it in our notes as this, paradox. Sometimes we will call this an oxymoron or oxymoron. We'll use the literary term hyperbole. That is to say, two things that don't fit together or are exaggerated in some way. A paradox is a good word here. How can something be empty, hollow, but at the same time full or stuffed? We are the hollow men. We are the empty men. And then he uses an interesting word picture. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's his word picture here? A scarecrow. A scarecrow. Good. Write it down. This is really important. A scarecrow. Scarecrows, think about it. They are stuffed full of what? Mr. Am Amsbach? They are, stu they are stuffed full of? They're stuffed full, right? They're stuffed full of hay, right? Or straw, right? But they're empty in what way? They're empty in regards to having any life to them. How can a human being be both empty, hollow, and stuffed? We'll come back tomorrow, and that's where we will begin to ask some questions of this poem. Thank you for your kind attention.